began to devour an enormous prime rib right in front of me. And uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, brother man, gluttony's still a sin, even if you're Catholic or not, right? So we're going to talk about, uh, I thought it'd be pertinent to talk about this subject today, considering what we did on Thursday, and probably continue to do, if you're like me, on Friday, and maybe even continue to do a little bit into Saturday as well. And so... uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, We we recognize there are times for feasting as well, and so I'm not implying by any stretch of the imagination that that was sin, but I do think it's something for us to talk about. So I want to invite you in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'll begin reading there in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and all we're going to do is just extract a general principle for Christian living there. Again, like I said, it's just more of a lighthearted topic today. Uh, But this is going to be page 955 in your pew Bible. 955. All things are lawful for me, the Apostle Paul writes, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual morality but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexually, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now make no mistake, this passage is about sexual morality, which was a malady that was uh, particularly afflicting this congregation in um, Corinthia at at this time, in Corinth rather. And we're going to discuss some of the general principles laid out in this passage concerning gluttony and indulgence and about how these things particularly relate to the body that we've been given. I like something that C.S. Lewis wrote actually in a book uh, called The Four Loves. And he talks about if you just survey the overall view of history, there have been different groups, different philosophical schools who have addressed the body differently. If you go to the ancient pagans, they believed that the body was a prison house, right? It's something meant to uh, flee from. The body was bad, wicked, fleshly, all this kind of stuff. We need to escape from the body. You go to newer pagans, the neo-pagans, and they glorified the body. They thought it was the best, and we had various nudist colonies and so forth. But thirdly, we have what I believe is the Christian view, he says. It's the view expressed by people like St. Francis of Assisi whenever he called his body Brother Donkey. He likened it to a donkey. And the reason why is because he says no one in his senses can either revere or hate a donkey. It is useful, it is sturdy, it is lazy, it is obstinate, it is patient, it is lovable, it's an infuriating beast, deserving now a stick and a carrot and now a carrot, both pathetically and absurdly beautiful, so the body. That is the way that we're supposed to view it. And it's really that view that's undergirding a lot of the things that Paul is writing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What is a Christian view of the body? It is both difficult and beautiful at the same time, and there is an impetus to treat it properly. Why is this? Well, uh, the reason why Christianity, for some reason, unlike Buddhism, unlike Islam, which philosophically have a lower view of the body, and yet they seem to take care of it better, why is it that we abuse it? Well, I think it's because of a lack of restraint. It's a lack of discipline. It's because of gluttony. So I just have two points this morning. And then we'll have the scripture reading. Here's the first point I want to make, and that is the danger of appetite. The danger of appetite. This is a real picture of me on Thursday as I was enjoying some of my mother's uh, dressing, right, in Turkey. Um, So we see in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is not just specifically speaking about the lust for illicit sexual encounters, but he's generally speaking about the body. And about the appetites and the desires that we have and thinking about how are we supposed to address these things. Even speaking about food, particularly if you're looking in your Bible there in verse 13, right? He's generally talking about gluttony. 
And we have to be careful because we can actually be enslaved, he says in verse, 20, uh, verse 12, rather, to our own lusts or desires. Now, first of all, what do I mean by gluttony, right? Now, the word gluttony is actually only used a few times in your Bible, right? Glutton, gluttony, gluttonous, only a handful of times in the Bible. And it's from the Hebrew word meaning to shake. And it's the idea of, of essentially being loose morally, right? You're not sturdy, you're not firm, you shake, you're loose morally. So gluttony does not mean less than someone who consistently overeats, but it certainly means more. It means, as one brother said, they're a free liver, right? Not, not the, you know, the body part, but, but they live free, right? They're unrestrained, they're given to loose and excessive living. And what causes us to be gluttonous is, is not restraining the many, many physical desires that we have. I think about that story, that story of warning that informs so much of even what the Hebrew writer had written in Hebrews chapter 4 when he talks about, uh, in Hebrews chapter 3 as well. In Numbers chapter 11, one of the, uh, the Israelites are leaving. They're going through that mass exodus away from Egypt. And it says in verses 4 through 6 of Numbers 11, Now the rabble that was among them had a strong craving. And the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks. What, what's a leek? The onions and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now keep in mind, this was bread from heaven, you guys, okay? It was heavenly bread. Is there anything better than that? And yet they were complaining against it. And the Bible says that the Lord's anger blazed against them because they were complaining, even after he had given them the food of angels. And so Moses says, all right, that's how it's going to be. Well, God's going to give you food for a whole month. And not only that, but it's going to be coming out of your nostrils even as you eat it. The Lord brought quail through a wind, made them drop to the ground until it was over a foot tall there in the area. And while they were still eating, the anger of the Lord consumed them by a plague because of their intense craving, because of their gluttony. Listen to me. Here's the point. Ladies and gentlemen, lack of restraint will get us in trouble and will cause us actually to be unthankful for what we have and push us to rebel and complain against God. There, there are many specific fruits of gluttony. It looks like different things. Laziness. A lazy person is a glutton. Overeating, alcoholism, drug addiction, promiscuity, all of these many different faces of gluttony. And you might be thinking, well, if the Bible doesn't say that much about gluttony, then why are we even talking about it right now? Well, actually, the, the place where, where glutton, gluttony is talk, spoken about, uh, you know, prolifically is in the book of Proverbs. I mean, you have passages like this, Proverbs 23 and verse 20. Hear, my son, and be wise and direct your heart in the way. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. This aspect of, of wisdom should undergird the way that people live. You see, there is a moderation that is characteristic of the Christian life. There is a temperance that we should all have, and that will contribute to the greatest good. I mean, think about it this way. What, what do we typically pray for? If you had to say, what are the top 10 hits of your prayers? If you had to write them down on a piece of paper right now, what would you say? I want to invite you to turn your Bible with me to Proverbs chapter 30. I want to show you one of my most favorite prayers in the entire Bible, okay? Proverbs chapter 30, and let me ask you a question. Have you ever prayed anything like Agur prayed in Proverbs chapter 30? And I want to start reading in verse, verse 7. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7. Ask yourself if you've ever prayed anything like this. Two things I ask of you. Do not deny them to me before I die. Number one, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Number two, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Why? Lest I be fool and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Have you ever prayed anything like that? 
God, I'm not asking you for riches. I'm not asking you that I be like some of these people who have a million followers on Instagram. I'm not asking you that I have, you know, up to my eyeballs in, in all the various goodies and trinkets that I want and money and, 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 and Google and, and Amazon and everything else. I'm not asking you for that. I'm not asking for riches. I'm not asking for poverty. Just give me enough. Just let me be content. So I'm not poor and decide to go steal and profane the name of God. So I'm not so rich that I forget you who gives me and provides everything that I need for my comfort. What if we began to pray like that, right? It's why Solomon wrote, for example, the princes should feast for strength and not for drunkenness in Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 17. That is for what is needful and not overindulgence everywhere. And all of the wisdom writers, this idea of temperance and moderation is rife. Gluttony is completely contrary to who we are in Christ. Faith is about self-denial. It's about, gluttony is about self-indulgence. And we have to search ourselves to see where this fruit is in every specific area of our lives. Now, I want to move on to point number two, and that's where we get really practical for a moment. And we talk about the benefits of discipline. All right, now here's the big picture. We have to be mindful of our desires and strive to be disciplined, to show some restraint uh, in all areas of life, not because of some arbitrary rule, right? Not because of some law that we have to obey, but because, quite frankly, God designed our body. Do you ever think about that? God formed our inward parts. He knows how it's meant to operate. It is to be used to serve him for his glory. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. That's what he says there. That's the bottom line. And God just so happened to design us in a way that if we don't practice self-control, we will physically deteriorate and our health will diminish. And here's the point. This can adversely affect our spiritual lives too. I cannot tell you guys how many times I've spoken to somebody, maybe we're sitting across the table, Starbucks, you know, just just hanging out together. And that's whenever Christians do their mutual uh, therapizing, right? That's, That's when we have mutual therapy and we talk to each other and pray for each other and confess to each other. How many times have I spoken to somebody and they've talked about a deep spiritual issue they had and really it wasn't as much of a spiritual issue It wasn't as much that, you know, woe is me, doom and gloom, you know, God doesn't love me anymore. It wasn't so much that than it was that they just needed to go get a gym membership. Or they needed to have a job. Or they needed to do something productive with their hands so that they could have some sense of self-satisfaction because they accomplished something in this world. Or maybe they should have been getting, you know, a solid eight hours of sleep. Or maybe they shouldn't have, you know, been addicted to various substances, right? Or a mass uh, sugar consumption. It was something physical that affected adversely their spiritual lives. Sometimes how you're doing spiritually is really based on how your body is going, uh, what your body is going through physically. I, I love the way that Charles Spurgeon put this, okay? I'm talking about this is like common sense, amazing stuff here. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. The condition of your body must be attended to. A little more common sense would be great gain to some who are ultra spiritual and attribute all their moods of feeling to some supernatural cause when the real reason lies far nearer to hand. Has not it often happened that a headache has been mis- mistaken for backsliding? Let me say it again. Has, uh, has it not often happened that a headache has been mistaken for backsliding and indigestion has been set down as a bad heart? That's brilliant, right? And that's why it's beneficial to care for our bodies. We are both body and spirit, and we should be concerned about this because that's what Paul basically says in our text in verses 19 and 20. Now, let's speak practically for a few moments on uh, things we could probably work on to better use our bodies to God's glory. Now, just as a caveat, note, I'm saying this specifically, um, we cannot bind any suggestions I'm about to make, okay? Tyler doesn't think that you're more sinful if you don't do this. Tyler doesn't think you're more holy if you do do these things, right? You just, you just can't do that. But I will make suggestions based on principles I found in the Bible, wisdom principles, concerning three things in particular. And that is eating, number one. Number two, exercising. And number three, rest, right? And it's our responsibility to find out how these principles will shape our life in a way that will glorify God. Here's the first one, and that is eating. Biblically speaking, how are we supposed to view food? And you would think that's a no-brainer, right? 
But typically, you survey church history, it's not always been a no-brainer. There are some religious groups who have certain feast days, and there's some religious groups who say you need to abstain from fish for a particular amount of time. There's all these different views about how the Christian's supposed to relate to food. Even the Jews themselves had various foods they were meant to abstain from. Here's what the Bible teaches about food. It is a gift from God. And Paul teaches that nothing shall be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. All right? Many of us obey that passage to a T on Thursday. Nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving in 1 Timothy chapter 4. But how do we handle the gift of food? Like all good gifts, these things can be abused. And the simple truth is that our diets have a lot to do with how we feel, spiritually even, how we perform, spiritually even. First of all, we should remember the principles just discussed from Proverbs, that we should eat more to satisfy hunger and gain strength rather than merely to taste something good. Proverbs 25 and verse 16 says this, Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. General common sense principle, right? But Paul made this statement in 1 Corinthians 6 that he would not be enslaved to anything. And likewise, we can get addicted to certain foods, can't we? You know what I'm talking about. Anyone who's been to Hillegoss Bakery knows what I'm talking about. We can get addicted to food. And so, receiving with thanksgiving and all things in moderation. Here's the second thing, exercise. Paul even gave some principles about exercise in 1 Corinthians 9 and in 1 Timothy chapter 4. He said, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, of course, again, the main principle is not about physical things there. He's talking about the way that we practice self-control so we may inherit a prize. But the principle is still there for Paul to use. First Timothy 4, physical training is of some value, he says there, to Timothy. Now, even though these passages hold some strong principles for us to follow, I know that the Bible hardly has anything to say about physical exercise. I realize that. But then just stop and think about it for a moment. Think about the world in which the Bible was written. Think about the way that people lived their lives in those days. You see... In the days of the Bible, people didn't lead the kind of lives that we lead. They didn't have the modern, you know, sedentary lifestyle where we're sitting eight, nine hours at a computer screen all day. They worked. They walked. They farmed. The only kind of labor was manual, really. So even if the Bible doesn't have a ton to say about exercise, I suspect if Paul lived today and he saw the condition, he probably would have a thing to, or two to say about this. He probably would. But how will these biblical principles play out in your life? Hopefully it will be exercise. You know, some, some studies say this generation might be the first in a long time not to outlive their parents. That's how unhealthy we are. And there are amazing benefits to exercise. One medical report says this. This was shared um, by John Piper in one of his books. He says, exercise advances the treatment of clinical depression and anxiety. Clinical depression and anxiety. Regular brisk walking cuts the incidence of sleep disturbances in half in people who suffer from them. Either brief periods of intense training or prolonged aerobic workouts raise levels of chemicals in the brain, such as endorphins, adrenaline, serotonin, dopamine. You don't need to know anything about those chemicals except they make you feel good, right? <laughs> the produce feelings of pleasure. Aerobic exercise is also linked with improved mental vigor, including reaction time, acuity, and math skills even. Now, if we engage in this to aid our bodies, to extend our lives in most cases, so that we could continue to serve our God with our bodies, will not God be more glorified? I think yes. I think yes. And lastly, rest. We need rest. God created a Sabbath for a reason. It signified that he himself rested. It was even included in the 10 most important commandments in the world, right? And Jesus later says that the Sabbath was created for man. We need rest. We need shalom. We need peace. We need healing. Even Jesus got away and invited his disciples to come away by themselves to a desolate place and rest a while. 
And what makes us think that we're so powerful that we don't need it? Not resting is ultimately a sign of self-reliance. I want to tell you something. I'm not trying to preach, okay, even though technically I'm a preacher. <laughs> um, there are times whenever I do wonder if the reason why, man, worship was just not with it today. Man, I just didn't get very much out of Bible class. Man, I was sleeping in the sermon or whatever. Happens because of what we're doing Saturday night. Now, I realize some people can't escape from that because of various work schedules. I get it. I'm not trying to harp on anybody. But, you know, sometimes Sunday, Sunday's preparation begins Saturday night. Sometimes it means taking a little mental preparation to realize what we're going to be doing and trying to be an encouraging spirit to those who are coming together to congregate to worship the Lord on Sunday. It's something we have to think about, and really it's common sense. As we all know, sometimes we have to work a little less, even to be able to work more in the long run, right? I love what Spurgeon says on rest. He says, quote, A day's breathing of fresh air upon the hills or a few hours ramble in the beech woods. Their shade, their calm, would sweep the cobwebs out of the brain. A mouthful of sea air or a stiff walk in the wind's face would not give grace to the soul, but it would yield oxygen to the body, which is the next best. For lack of opportunity or inclination, these great remedies are neglected, and the student becomes a self-immolated victim. How many times I needed just to get up and take a walk? Maybe you do too. We are body and spirit, and we need to take care of both in order to be wholesome and to bear fruit and to be the most effective God-glorifying versions of us we can be. And so that means eat as right as you can, exercise often, get plenty of rest, and that aiding of the daily words of Christ and dependent on prayer of God will do wonders to overall effectiveness in our lives for Jesus. All right, finally, as 1 Corinthians 6 teaches, this is an issue of belonging. You have to ask the question at the end of the day, who does our body belong to? Paul says, Jesus. Verses 19 through 20, you were purchased with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And that means we will practice self-control in moderation and temperance. It means we will fight against self-indulgence. And we can never forget who provides us with the power to do so. And that is Jesus. For as Paul says in verse 13, the body is meant for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Go ahead and bow your heads with me as we go to God in prayer. <coughs> Almighty Father in heaven, we are thankful to you, O Lord, for this past week where we could spend time with some of our family that maybe we haven't seen for a while that we were able to feast with thanksgiving and we received everything, Father, as a gift from your hand. Only now, Father, we ask that um, you would teach us wisdom with regards to our bodies, that we would walk as the wisdom writer has taught us to walk, that we would be content, that we would practice moderation and temperance. We also ask that you would teach us joy with our food, not that we would go to it as some sort of idol, um, feeding into a craving, um, helping us to be dependent upon these things whenever we're feeling low, but teach us contented joy with the good gifts that you give us. And Father, we also ask that you teach us generosity with our homes, that we would be open and willing to share our table with those who have not. Father, we're thankful for any opportunity there is to gather, and we ask that you go with us in this moment of worship. We do pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We'll have a scripture reading. Reading this morning will be from Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. If you're using a pew Bible, that will be on page 814. In verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax
tax collectors and sinners. But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Will Mount now be dismissed? 